Hello and welcome to the History with Jackson podcast. This episode of History of Jackson was sponsored by the Bean Around Coffee. Bean Around Coffee is based in Peterborough and they sell and make some amazing coffee. You can head to their website to buy some coffee beans or some coffee grounds. Now they make some fantastic coffee and it is my favourite coffee in the country. And for you want to grab yourself some coffee, head to www.thebeanaround.com and use discount code HWJ and the bear. 10 for 10% off all your purchases. I'll leave the discount code and the website in the description below. Welcome to the podcast today, guys. And today we are joined by Max Adams, author of The Museum of the Wood Age. Now, how are you doing, Max? Thank you very much for coming on. I'm um, very well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast there. Just the, I firstly want to say to you, you know, this is an absolutely fantastic book. Um, and I could, I could tell the amount of love that you put into this book um i could i could just feel it through the pages so i just want to thank you for writing this amazing book well thank you i mean i i did i, I don't always enjoy writing books but this one i did enjoy um <laughs> partly because the circumstances of covid forced me into writing a different book from the one i'd envisaged but secondly i'm, I'm very lucky to have a publisher who puts an awful lot of effort into the kind of creative side of it the design you know, the, the illustrations, the way the book's laid out, the typeface, you know, they really do care. Um, and, and, and sometimes it, you know, it really comes off. And this one, it kind of feels nice in the hand, I think, and it, and it opens nicely and it, it feels like it's got a, a quite rich content. I mean, apart from the writing, which is <laughs> not my business to, uh, to assess, but uh, it, it, was a, it was a fun project to do, I must say. No, I must, I must agree with that. I think Head of Zeus has done a fantastic job putting this book together. And I must thank Head of Zeus for sending me across a copy of this book as well. So thank you very much, everyone at Head of Zeus. Now, first question I want to ask you, Max, is how did you initially get interested into the, the history of wood? Well, um, I was an archaeologist professionally and by training. And of course, as an archaeologist, you're always trying to recover what's been lost, what's the failures, if you like, of past civilizations. And it's always in the back of your mind what you're not seeing. And in archaeology, we call it the Houdini principle. It's the stuff that doesn't ever get found. Pottery we find, stone we find, metal we find, textiles very rarely, leather very rarely, and wood very rarely. And, you know, that, that's, that's just an ever-present understanding in archaeology. And then um, in my late 30s, I had a whim to go and live in a wood, um, uh, which I did, um, uh, and lived off grid for three years and, and learned really from scratch how to work with wood. And of course, the more I worked with wood, the more I realised how much archaeology is missing that, that element of intangible and how much I could understand about the past by understanding that that relationship between people and wood. You know, it's so fundamental to the way we deal with our material world. Um, and that, that's really what started me on this trail. That's, a, that's an interesting way to, to look at it. I think it's absolutely fascinating that you went off to, to live in the wood. I think very, very well, huge swathes of people would be very jealous of that lifestyle. So, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, uh, it was fascinating and it was amazing. Um, I, you know, I... I the hardship didn't bother me. I didn't, I didn't miss, you know, when the wind blew, we had electricity. When we cut down trees, we could put the fire on. And when we pumped water, we could have a shower. You know, that, that's how it worked. I have a very young son. He was only three months old when we moved into the wood. Um, it doesn't seem to have done him any harm. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, there, there are challenges and struggles. But, you, you know, you live off your own means and there's something incredibly satisfying. I mean, of course, it's quite popular now going off grid and living like <laughs> that. In the early 90s, it was, I mean, I, th I think a lot of my work colleagues thought I was utterly bonkers. Um, but that's okay. I don't <laughs> mind being bonkers. <laughs> No, it sounds completely fine. So I'm not, I'm not calling you bonkers at all, Max. Now I want, I want to ask one, you know, this is, this book is about the history of wood, um, the museum of the wood age. Where, where does the history of wood begin then? 
Well, when I first started on this project, I wanted to write about the relationship of humans with wood. And as an archaeologist, of course, I go back to the old Stone Age uh, and think of, you know, the stone axes that archaeologists dig up. And the missing part is the, the handle that the axe is hafted to. And then, of course, I realized looking for the oldest wooden artifacts and the oldest wooden artifacts we have are, are in the region of 400,000 years old. I mean, you know, very, very old. And there aren't any modern humans around that 400,000 years ago. So the history of the Wood Age goes back beyond humans. And that's quite a striking thing to think. I mean, obviously, you can, you can look at our primate cousins, and we know that chimpanzees will fish for ants with a stick, and we know they can dig around in the ground and, and find grubs. And actually, the, the, the masters, the early masters of wood are the orangutans, because they've, they've dis, uh, discovered by experiment this thing called the green stick fracture. So you, you take a, a, a living branch of wood, finished branch, and you snap it but you don't break it entirely in two. And in snapping it, what you can do is, is bend it, twist it, and form it, as it were, sort of weave it between other branches, but it doesn't entirely break. And orangutans use this technique to create themselves a nest high up in the trees. Every night, they create a new nest. And actually, the earliest human shelters that have ever been found, and they're really just stake holes in the ground, are no more than nests. So the orangutans were there first. Well, I assume our primate ancestors were pretty quick to cotton on to the same principle. And so right from the beginnings of human evolution, we are experimenting with the material that can be found in the forest, finding out what happens when you do things to wood. So it's springy. It's sometimes strong in one direction. It's weak in other directions. It has very high levels of, of ability to absorb compression. So we're experimenting with this stuff, finding out what it'll do, and no doubt finding that different trees have wood that's of different capabilities and properties. So, for example, you know, we think of wood as floating, but there are some woods that don't float. Lignum vitae is so heavy that it simply sinks. And, and balsa, I mean, the, the word balsa in, um, in Spanish simply means raft. So, you know, from the very earliest sort of intellectual probing of the world by finding out, you know, what tastes good, what tastes bad, what makes you sick, what makes you better. Wood is absolutely inherent to that exploration and to the idea that human beings are a technological species. We like finding out how things work and then using them. And so, I mean, fascinatingly, the oldest wooden artifact we have just about is a, is an, is a, a spear point, a wooden spear point dug up off the mud um, in, in the mud in the Essex marshes in early 1900s. It's called the Clacton Spear, and it doesn't reside in the Science Museum as the earliest human artifact. It lives in a glass case in the Natural History Museum because it's an artifact of human evolution. It stands next to the skulls of the creatures who were around at the time, and that's not modern humans. Oh, that's... I've... I've, I've... I've re I've, you know, you tend to think of history as just being that, you know, homo sapien kind of scale. But when you, when you put it in context of there's other, there's other primates who are using these, these tools, you really yeah. start to think about the expanse of history. Yeah. And, and what I call the wood age, which is essentially all of history up until the 18th century. You know, I, I choose the 18th century. We're, we're used to thinking of human technology in terms of stone age, bronze age, then iron age. Actually, it's all been a wood age because wood is always the primary material with which you you fashion, create, and manipulate your world. Um, it's just that it's invisible because it rots. G generally speaking, <laughs> very very rarely you find ancient wood um, such that you know we we have the Clacton spear, we have half a dozen spears from two, three hundred thousand years ago from a from a mine in Germany and one or two other artifacts, early digging sticks. You know, that, that's the fundamental tool is the, the stick that you dig a hole with and find water. You find roots that are edible. You poke things, you protect yourself with a stick. You carry stuff with a stick. Stick, it works as a lever. Um, and 
although our primate cousins are adept at using sticks for some things, they never really learned to exploit the underground with sticks to the same extent that humans did. And that's why our main competitors on the early savannah, when we're, we're just beginning to walk upright, our earliest rivals and competitors are baboons, highly gifted creatures, omnivorous like we are, and very good at exploring the savannah. But they never figured out how to dig for water or find roots. And that means that humans were able to outcompete them, travel further than them, and exploit new resources that their competitors couldn't. And it's technology that does that. And of course, the technology of understanding how to manipulate something with your hand to make, to fashion something new also comes with the ability to communicate. So the brain and the hand are evolving at the same time. And I suspect that wood may be the medium, one of the media, that is primary in teaching us how to be humans. Well, I wanted to touch on that point, actually, about the the increased the increasingly sophisticated use of of wood uh becoming tools you know, when when about does this when about in history does this happen and then what kind of you know you've touched slightly on uh communication and language what what is the impact of wood starting to be used as a tool in a more sophisticated manner well in one sense of course we can't possibly know because the artifacts that would really tell us the moment when dot 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 something something was invented are gone even if we find the clacton spear and we know it's the oldest wooden artifact in the world it clearly couldn't be the first one yeah. uh, there, there are many 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 missing links we don't know the first time two sticks were rubbed together um, and people found out how to make fire um, we we now have what we think is the oldest fire so far known and that's about half a million years ago again pre-modern human um, we know that stone um, stone axes or stone hammers were being made and manipulated, you know, several hundred thousand years ago. And that implies brain function and language and communication. And also that that special grip humans have got, the opposed thumb grip that we share with some of our uh, primate cousins. Um, so all those moments are lost. Um, and in a sense, it's part of the purpose of the story of the Museum of the Wood Age to recreate as a thought experiment the things that we will never find. In other words, we, we have to imagine that those things happened um, and they often seem to have happened in more than one place independently. Um, we know that certain key inventions were made both in South America and in Europe and in Asia pretty much the same time within you know, thousands of years. So. A lot of these things were not invented just once. They seem to have been invented multiple times. Um, so if you take the really simple basic devices that humans rely on for their sort of mechanical advantage over, you know, cats, for example, that can't pick a tool up. Yeah. Uh, well, the lever is the principal one. Of course, a, a stick is a lever. It gives you mechanical advantage because you can you can open and lift things and move things around that you couldn't otherwise. You can lift up a heavy log with a lever that you couldn't lift up with your own strength. And of course, humans compared to gorillas, for example, and chimpanzees are, are, are very weak, incredibly puny animals. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but, but with the aid of a lever, as Archimedes said, give me a lever and I will move the earth. Um, uh, and once you understand lever and pivot, you've understand some really fundamental principles about physics and motion. And then there's the spring. You bend a tree back and let it go and you've got a spring and the spring leads to the snare it, uh, it, it leads to um, the fishing rod it leads to all sorts of useful devices uh, um, including the idea that the sprung action of a piece of wood can hold another piece of wood in place and the orangutans understand that when they're building their nest they understand the springiness of wood and obviously humans evolved that and then at some point we invent this wonderful thing called cordage the rope, the lashing, the string, the vine, the twine, the stuff that allows us to join stuff together. You, you can't have a, a functional ax without being able to bind a sharp stone to a piece of wood. It's really very, very difficult. So very early on, humans must learn how to twist plant fibers to make them stronger. Um, and then they learn knots. I mean, you know, how, how complex are knots? 
I mean, sailors are forever trying to teach me how to tie a yeah. boat every, every time I forget. Um, but, you know, uh, hum, humans mastery of knots and how to lash things together and keep things tight and bind things. I mean, we're, we're stuck without knots. Um, I mean, in the book, I talk about uh, the Iceman, Utzi, who was dug out of the, the Austrian Italian Alps um, nearly 20 years ago now. And, you know, his his remains are kind of an inventory of all that, that kit. You know, he's got axes, he's got a bow, which is, of course, a, a spring. And a bow only works because it's got a gut string on it. And that, that's, of course, cordage and spring. Um, uh, and he's got all sorts of things dangling from his belt, which are tied by knotted cords. So, you know, those little devices we take for granted. The windlass, you know, watch a child pick up a stick and then wind a piece of twine around it. They might try and use it as a fishing rod or to, to yeah. dangle something down a well. But if if you're holding a, a stick and this cord wound around it and there's a fish on the other end and the fish runs, what you can do is loosen your hands and that stick will spin in your hands. Well, you've just you've just created the fundamentals of what will later become the wheel because you've just got a shaft and a bearing and rotary motion. So all these things are discovered, whether they're accidents or children playing, or whether, as in I think the case of the wheel, some brilliant engineering mind saw the complete invention and then set out to make it. And that's absolutely uniquely human. To see something that doesn't exist, that has never existed, to envision it and then plan how to make it. That's, ap that's absolutely the step change in human technological evolution to a, a bit like the sculptor who sees the human form inside a block of stone. The engineer does the same with materials. They understand how to, I don't know, make an arch um, that has never existed before. Of course, m many of those things are, are in nature and we can be inspired by nature. Springs, levers, windlasses are all there in nature. Things that float, it's all there in nature. The wheel isn't. The wheel does not but exist. It just simply doesn't but exist. There's a, it, it does, and when you, when you even try and think of something in nature that comes across, there's, there's nothing. And, and like you touch on your book as well, they, they, they couldn't chop down trees to roll them because they didn't have the tools to do that. Well, they pretty early on learn how to get a tree down. Um, I mean, some of the, some of the huge. Uh, western red cedars that were being pulled down by by people on the pacific northwest of the of the american continent um with stone tools are hugely impressive i mean big two three hundred feet trees brought down with stone tools and fire um and what they do is they use the principles they understand you know they understand how to weaken a tree they understand how to chop away at it and you know they understand the the motion uh, and, and, the, and the physical effect of what they do on, on the material. But, you know, those are experiments accumulated over tens of thousands of years of knowledge and understanding. And I dare say lots of mistakes that led to injuries, fatalities, um, stupidity. <laughs> you know, <laughs> te technology is littered with mistakes and we tend to only see the successful outcome. I mean, how many attempts there were at making a wheel, heaven only knows. We, we only see the first or some of the early successful outcomes of that experiment. But you do get the impression that occasionally someone will just see something and then they set about making it. Yeah. And, and to unpack the point about the wheel, you know, what, what kind of, you know, when, when about do we think the wheel emerges as a, as a technology and, and what, what kind of impact do you, does the wheel have on, early man moving forward into civilized eras well i mean you can't underestimate the wheel i mean take yeah. I mean, the, the wheel was invented independently in two places we know that once in south america where it was only ever used as a as a toy there are some quite old toy wheels in south america certainly pre-european contact um in europe well it was probably invented in on the asian steppes um, around the Caucasus uh, once and more or less at the same time in Mesopotamia, the Fertile Crescent. 
and under two rather different circumstances. One, I think it comes out of oxen pulling a plough to, to turn to cultivate soil. And um, w we know that an early version of the sled called the travoir essentially is like a stretcher, um, which the, the front two bits of it are attached to the beast and the back end of it drags along the ground. Um, and you can carry stuff with it uh, if you've got a beast of burden, which is trained. Or, and once you've got cultivation, of course, you've got domesticated oxen. So you've got the means to you've got the traction device and you've got the idea of a frame. And then if you imagine putting casters on that sledge, eventually you get to the wheel. And there is some pictorial evidence from sort of fifth millennium BC of a travoir, a sledge with little casters on the back. And then we don't find the earliest wheeled vehicle, but when we do find we wheeled vehicles, they seem to appear both in the Fertile Crescent and then on the Asian steppes. And there, they're associated not with cultivation, because these are the great oceanic grasslands of Central Asia, but with the domestication of the horse or the taming of the horse, which itself is a, an extraordinary technological achievement, the domestication of the horse, and then the need to follow huge herds of wild horses across the Asian steppes with all your belongings. Okay, And I think the wheel yeah. becomes a sort of highly prestigious way of being able to follow the herds. Um, and many of these horses end up in Middle Eastern markets. So there's clearly a link between the steppes and the Fertile Crescent. And somewhere in there, the wheel is invented. And interestingly enough, at the same time, the, the, the wool producing sheep is also developed. And one of the technologies that the wool producing sheep evolves is the, the spinning device. The oldest one we know of is the drop spindle, which is a flywheel on a little, on a little, it look, you know, imagine a knitting needle inside a CD and you spin the knitting needle yeah. and the CD rotates it as a flywheel and you, and you can spin yarn with it. And the fact that the spindle seems to emerge at the same time as the wheel rather suggests that there's something in the spindle, which effectively is a, a wheeled device, fixed wheel, fixed axle wheel device, and then you turn it on its side and stick another CD, as it were, on it, another disc on it. Yeah. And you've got a, and you've got a device that will rotate like an axle. And that combination of axle, shaft, and bearing which occurs in the drop spindle and then occurs again in the wheel at roughly the same time and in roughly the same place suggests to me that one of the experiments might have been watching a child or watching someone play with a, with a, a spinning spindle with two discs on it. Because if you're a child, it's an almost irresistible experiment to make. You know, you, you nick a spindle and two spindle whirls off your mum or whoever's doing the, the spinning and you play and then suddenly you've got this thing that rolls along the ground and somebody goes oh that's interesting and then it's another and leap to, to create the, the axle that moves you know that f rotates freely around it's you know the wheel that rotates freely but it's a, 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 i mean and and in south america it never takes off as a technology for the simple reason that if however politely you ask a llama, the llama <laughs> will, will not be encouraged to tow a cart up a hill. <laughs> they, don't, they, don't no. have, they don't have the physical structure to do that. An oxen can be yoked around the neck to pull a wheeled vehicle, and a horse, of course, can be yoked around the breastbone. Crucially, horse is much more powerful traction beast than the ox. Um, but the llama, mm-mm. Um, and of course, in North America, the sled and the travoir are used, but the, the wheel is never invented because because they don't get the horse till the 16th, 17th century, after which they do adopt the wheel, um, but not before then. So, you, so you, you, you both need the technology of the wheel and a beast that will be domesticated to pull it. Otherwise, there's no point. It's just a toy. Yeah, you can't, it's, it's almost that perfect storm of, of conditions. It to, is to create in that. It looks like it happens twice, once with pastoralists, once with agriculturalists, and within, oh, half a millennium, the wheel has spread right across Europe.
I mean, the, the, I mean, literally spread across Europe because, of course, it moves at the yeah. speed that you can pull it. So the technology moves at huge speed as far as ancient technology goes. Um, uh, and it's very, very quickly adopted all the way across the European continent. And, 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 and the rest is literally history because the wheel is yeah. <laughs> profoundly liberating as, as the sailing ship is. You know. Well, I was just about to ask about that, and I thought, so that's a perfect segue. Um, the the use of of woods are for transport off land uh, for the sailing boat. How does how does that come about then? Uh, I know you've well, mentioned missing, already missing some all those, all those missing links, aren't we? Um, I mean, you can you can sew up a sheepskin and blow air into it, and it'll float. Um, you can find a log that'll float and hold on to one end of it and paddle with it. Um, so I don't, I, I think the idea of using some sort of flotation device to cross to an island or to cross a river must have come about very early and many times. Um, and in all parts of the world, in all cultures, there are things that will float. Um, in South America and in the Near East, reed bundle rafts are independently invented, still in use today. You know, technology that's as good as it needed to be still works. Um, uh, very light woods like balsa, which are very easy to carve out. I and mean, you, you set a fire in, you know, you split a log in half, you set a fire in it and scrape out the, the burnt stuff. And eventually you end up with a hollow flotation device. I mean, they're not very stable, but in the Pacific, <laughs> world, they learn how to put an outrigger on a canoe. And that's how they cross the Pacific. Um, uh, in the Pacific Northwest, they make ever more sophisticated dugout log canoes such that they can hollow them out with a very, very thin outer sheath of wood. And then they they bend and stretch the wood until it forms a much more stable um, flotation device. And, of course, the paddle is a lever. So, you know, the paddle comes with the boat. Um, the sail, different. Uh, we, we can't really say when the sail is invented. Um, what we do know is that the the square rig sail that is, essentially allows the wind to push you along is much earlier than the fore and aft rigged sail, which allows you to sail much closer to the origin of the wind. But again, that was invented in several different places in the Pacific, um, probably along the Nile um, and probably in various other places. Um, but of course, the the boat once invented or the, the flotation device once invented is ad adopted by coastal and riverine and, and, and lake dwelling communities. We, we, we know without having the craft that the oldest sea crossings were about 65,000 years ago. That's, that's a long time ago. That's, so yeah, that, that's 60,000 <laughs> years before the wheel. People were crossing from Asia to Australasia because that's how the Aborigines got to Australia. Um, we know the Mediterranean was being explored, you know, 20,000 years ago. Um, uh, so, you know, the, the evolutionary trajectory from raft to dugout to canoe, and of course, you know, things like the birch bark canoe are incredibly sophisticated. Um, sailing devices absolutely perfect for the materials at hand and for the use in you know the the, the northern uh, rivers and lakes of of canada and and in each community that needed a a boat invented its own particular design i mean in, in ireland even into the 20th century almost every cove or creek on the west coast of ireland had its own specific design of boat for the specific sea conditions that it that they encountered um so i i think we're probably missing 95% of all the different types of craft that were ever invented. Obviously, you know, the obvious ones we know about, yeah. the Viking longship, the, the man of war. Um, I mean, the craft, the craft of making boats didn't really get much better after the Viking longship. Um, you know, in terms of a, a ship that's fit for its purpose, I mean, they're perfect um, and built with really three tools, an ax, which as everybody knows, chops in the line of the of, of the angle of force and adds, which is more like um, 
like a mattock or, or a shovel. It, the, the, the blade is square to the line of the force and it, it acts to plane things off and smooth things off and, and the chisel or drill um, to gouge things out. Um, uh, and it certainly used to be thought that, you know, that combination of tools that allowed humans to become what we would call carpenters must have come about with the first metal tools. But we now know that, for example, the mortise and tenon joint, the classic woodworking joint all over the world, is, is pre-metal tools because we've now found mortise and tenon joints in, in, in the linings of wells dug in Germany or, the, you know, that, that part of the world um, six, seven thousand years ago. So quite sophisticated joints were being used to make engineering constructions well before we have metal tools, which is which is really surprising. And it's it's interesting that everyone's coming up with their own ideas independently, uh, almost for the same the same aim. And I suppose there's there's a question in there really, which is you know these transportation or transportation devices are allowing people to be nomadic. Now, when when does wood play a part in people settling down and and becoming settled people? Well, I suppose you're looking at the transition between a, a nest or a, a bivouac shelter, which is essentially you know a nest on its side, which is designed really to um, reflect the flames of a bonfire back at you, to stop your back getting cold and protect your back from predators um and and from there to what we would call architecture um is something that happens really in relation to cultivation because if you are nomads of the asian steppes you're always on the move if you're arctic hunters you're always on the move um you make a dwelling when you need it the igloo is a is a is an ice nest it's the same principle as the nest um you can make it and use it a couple of times and then move on um and of course it leaves no archaeological trace whatsoever um we we find quite early hybrids between bivouac shelters that look like they're more permanently or at least seasonally occupied uh, oddly enough around the sea of galilee um uh, in in uh, Jordan, Israel, um, quite old, um, sort of 10, 12,000 years old. Um, you should find the holes of the stakes uh, as shadows in the soil. And the suspicion that these were either seasonal or permanent comes because there's a lot of animal bone debris lying around. There's, there's evidence of processes, manufacturing processes going on, tools being made. Um, and that tells you that a, that there is a more than a one night stand as it were and yeah. eventually of course that leads to the idea of perhaps having two different dwellings one summer one winter which you find all over the world um uh even into the historic period um and of course the more you invest in social hierarchy in power and in communities that are bound together by a common purpose the more you get the idea of putting up a structure that lots of people live in, communal structure. And it might be a whole family, and the roundhouse is the archetypal example of a, a family dwelling in, 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 in concentric space. Um, all the materials for a roundhouse can be gathered. In other words, you don't have to be a lumberjack to build a roundhouse. All the material for that comes from trees that you cut down regularly on a cycle to produce, you know, wood in the round of a certain bore um at a certain uh, you know width and 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 straightness um and we know that sort of management is going on in what we would call the neolithic period um there's a there's a trackway that was constructed across the somerset marshes uh, which i as you know i write about in the book called the sweet track discovered in the 1960s and excavated um which was a trackway built across the somerset marshes and we know when it was built, 3,807 BC, <laughs> dated to the year <laughs> by, by tree rings. One of the great things about the Sweet Track is because a lot of the timber, or a lot of the wood used for it was wood in the round. It still has all the rings in it. Squared off timber is missing rings, so you can't always date it accurately. But this, this trackway we can. 
uh, within within a few months of those trees being cut down. But we know from the fact that these these poles that were driven into the marshes are sort of X X shaped trestles and then joined by planks. Um, we know that they were cut from trees that were managed regularly, and again that suggests permanent dwelling because you're, you're, you're leaving your dwelling and you're going into the woods that you manage. Whereas if you're a nomad, you cut a, you cut a tree down or you cut a pole off a tree, but it's pretty, you know, it's, it's, it's foraging. Managing the landscape in an intensive way comes from farming, uh, woodland management, um, and, and what comes with that is a permanent dwelling. And the earliest permanent dwellings are either circular structures or they're what we call longhouses. In other words, a, a series of posts driven into the ground and then joined at the top with cross beams and then a, you know, a, a pointy roof stuck on the top. Um, and the earliest of those we find are, you know, seven, eight, well, maybe a bit more, thousand years. So actually, um, not that long ago. I mean, we're not, we're not talking 50,000 years that humans have lived in big architectural structures. As far as we know, Neanderthals who died out as little as 40,000 years ago didn't have anything like that sort of architectural structure. Um, so it's a, it's a key feature of social development. Um, and archaeologists often use those structures to make guesses about how society is structured because it's something very different about a big communal structure or, or, a settlement where one house is much bigger than the others. You know, that's where we start to see hierarchy and elite, maybe the origins of kingship. Um, but it's it's a bit easy to overread those signs. From a from a purely technological point of view, it's fascinating because it shows a desire to create something that is more permanent um, and something that has a you know a, a long building has a different feel from a round building. Round building is is about a focal point in the middle. Long buildings tend to have rank and hierarchy built into them. Not everybody's equal in a long building, by and large, and that tells you something about the way human society is evolving in step with its technology. Yeah, and when when we talk about you know long buildings and and roundhouses, that development is quite interesting because from a roundhouse you can move from one room to several rooms in a long house and like, and like you said bringing in hierarchy uh and one and one major um institution of hierarchy or or community that you that I, I could see woven woven throughout your book was was religion um you know what what kind of reli what kind of role does religion play or what kind of role does wood play in the development of religion and, and development of technologies relating to wood? Well, I think there are some complex things going on here, some of which I don't even touch on in the book because they're, they're as it were, a branch of the subject. Um, but I mean, uh, you know, clearly the relationship of humans to wood and the relationship of humans to individual trees is complex. You know, we, we can think of an ancient tree and attribute all sorts of things to it, like wisdom. Trees have been, you know, the Delphic Oracle was a, if effectively a uh, uh, a means of of consulting nature in the form of a tree ancient and wise um and in many ways sort of rather human like roots in the earth uh, aspiring to heaven but solid on the ground you know trees have got trunks we've got trunks the personification of the tree is as a sort of human figure writ large through literary tradition you know tolkien not least among them with his ents. Um, so there are, there's some very complex things going on there. Um, and we also know from certain monuments that are constructed that before Stonehenge, there's Woodhenge. Um, this extraordinary um, site excavated off the Norfolk coast or on the Norfolk coast uh, some years ago now, Seahenge, uh, which created a great flap at the time. Uh, and it's a circle of 50 odd oak posts, each one split in half, each one split in half by a different person. We know that because there are 50 different axes we used uh, to, to split those and fashion those oak posts with a huge upturned root. 
rammed into the earth at its centre. Well, you know, archaeologists sometimes have to retreat to the word ceremony or ritual or religion. By that, it just means we, we can't think of a practical function. But of course, in pre-literate societies, religion does have a practical function. You know, you, you want to ensure that your community is fertile and produces children. You want to ensure that the harvest will come in or that there will be abundant food. You want the salmon to be plentiful this year. You want the wheat to be plentiful, whatever. Um, you also want your livestock to be fertile and not to get sick. Um, you want there not to be an earthquake or a volcano or a drought or floods. And in order to tilt the odds in your favor, you have uh, whatever you like, a spirit world that you can consult, persuade, it's where the shaman figure comes in, <laughs> consult, persuade, open a line of communication. Is, is, is there something we can do to, to help you give us a better harvest? Um, now, if that constitutes religion, then you can call that religion. I mean, you know, these, these are difficult um, areas to get into, but clearly the idea of creating a monument in wood um, has something very elemental about it. I mean, into the 20th century, people were bringing a Yule log into the house. You know, um, the idea of uh, the the everlasting and sacrificial value of the yew tree. You know, the ancient yew trees are all in Christian graveyards. Um, you know, the everlasting evergreen leaves of the yew and the blood red of the berry, there is something very sacrificial about that. So it's entirely understandable that not only would you build monuments out of the living wood, the maypole, of course, is a classic traditional example, yeah. but also that you would fashion objects from wood in which spirituality was embedded. And the more love and effort you put into creating a sculpture, for want of a better word, the more value it has, the more magic it may possess. And the very oldest human figurines, which we have made of wood, are, you know, nine, 10,000 years old. Um, and they're pretty elemental when you look at them. Uh, and then, of course, you look at something like a, um, a totem pole, um, totem pole in inverted commas, a house pole from, from uh, the Pacific Northwest. And you look at, you know, we, we're pretty certain that some of the early settlements in the British Isles had totemic poles stuck up, you know, maybe with a tribal emblem on them or something. Um, sadly, we've lost them all. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the earliest decorative, figurative wooden artifact we have in this country is the coffin of St. Cuthbert, which was fashioned in the late seventh century, um, carved with figures of the apostles. And clearly, you know, wood is a useful thing to keep a dead body in, but there's more to it than just that. You know, it's not carved with the figures of the apostles for nothing. Um, and, you know, some of the greatest Viking ships we found had people buried in them. Very wealthy people buried with all their possessions, their tents, their beds, their buckets. I mean, a complete inventory of a wooden world um, going with them. Now, how much of that is religion and how much of that is practicality? I mean, wh why did so many Anglo-Saxon noble women take their beds to the grave with them? Practical? <laughs> maybe <laughs> religious, maybe um, artistic, maybe whatever. Um, you know, we don't know. Um, it's the great unknown. But um, I mean, uh, as you know from reading the book, uh, uh, at one point I I talk about um, a wooden building that seems both practical and heavily invested with the human spirit, and that is the the, the Elizabethan theatre. The wooden O of Shakespeare, partly because one of those theatres, the Fortune, we know almost everything about the way it was put together. We know where the timber came from. We know how it was shipped up the Thames. We we know how much it cost. Um, and the Globe was a copy of that theatre. We know that the Globe, the original Globe, opened in 1600. And we know that, I think we know that the first play performed there was Henry V. And the opening chorus of Henry V, which of course is, is the story of the Battle of Agincourt um, uh, in 1415, 
the opening chorus has this wonderful thing where Shakespeare asks the audience to conduct a thought experiment very explicitly. Pardon gentles all the flat unraised spirits that have dared on this unworthy scaffold, the stage being the scaffold. Um, how does it go? On this unworthy scaffold, can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? In other words, you have to imagine you're in France now. And then he goes on to say, or may we cram within this wooden O, the globe, the very casks that did affright the air at Agincourt, i.e. the blood, the smell, the guts of battle. It's a pure thought experiment. Um, and that is the nature of drama. And elsewhere, we see that Shakespeare understands the wooden theatre as a model of human society with its actors, its lovers, its kings, its hecklers. Um, and we see the behind the scenes of the globe, as in what goes on beneath society. And then we see him make this metaphor of, of um, the theatre as a model forest. And he talks about the forest, and as you like it, he talks about the forest as a model of society. So Shakespeare is very explicitly playing with this edge between the practicality of the theatre as an auditorium, but would and its relationship to humans as a model of sophisticated society, but would also as a remnant of the, the elemental forest. So he's playing all sorts of social, anthropological, moral games with his audience. And the globe, is, the wooden O is this model. And, and because of the way I, I constructed the book, which was supposed to be very heavily uh, dependent on traveling around the world, going to see artifacts and buildings and so on. And then COVID hit. So I necessarily <laughs> do a lot of this in my head. And, and at some point in my head, I saw the globe and the Shakespearean idea of drama, which is also religious and spiritual at the same time. You know, we're talking deep moral and, and philosophical questions raised in Shakespeare, still relevant today. Um, and then in the back of my mind, I had this idea of Seahenge on the Norfolk coast and having wondered how could we ever get at what it meant to the people who built it? Were they laughing? Were they crying when they built it? Was it deeply spiritual or was it just a way of keeping the plebs busy? And I thought, well, well, maybe Shakespeare's globe tells us exactly what's going on at Seahenge. Maybe it has an element of theatre and performance and religion and maybe it's all those things and if you think of where it was found right on the edge between the land the sea and the sky and you immediately cast yourself back to another shakespearean play um, the beginning of twelfth night where they're shipwrecked and the character asks you know that they land on the shore a foreign strange place where they don't know where they are and they ask what country friends is this and i think yeah that's sea henge what country is that? It's between, it's between all those states. So you think any idea that the people who constructed those ancient monuments are in some ways primitive, stupid, savage, or thick, we have to just throw that out. You know, these are people performing drama and theatre, every bit as sophisticated as Shakespeare. We've just lost the script. And that really makes you think about Stonehenge and the pyramids and all the other um, apparently simple ritual things that people have built in the past. And we, you know, we tend to patronise people in the past as being simple people, and they're not clearly. No, no, no and, and clearly you you have there has to be intelligence and complex thought to to create these structures and to have something going on within these structures, and you've. You, you've addressed a, a whole load, a whole plethora of misconceptions that many historians, many people, many history fans are going to have about these structures and these lives. Um, but you, you do touch on a very interesting point that I'd like to impact there is we're looking at culture as well. Um, a lot of things that we've spoken about today are you know, the interaction of words in, in life, uh, the interaction of words in you know, creating and the creation of food with culture, fun and leisure. How does, how does wood start to form that? You know, we have sport, we have music, we have uh, books. You know, these are important parts of, of life that 
wood plays an important role in. Yeah, when is the first digging stick used to play hockey? <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, watch children playing. They use all our tools for games. Uh, yeah, I, they're, they're clearly very important. Um, I mean, you only, you only have to watch a game of cricket and, and hear, hear the commentators talking about the bales and the ball and the bat and, you know, all that stuff. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, and you can go back and think of you hit one piece of wood with another and that's a percussion instrument. Um, and you find two bits of wood that are hollow and one has a different sound than another. And that's the beginnings of the xylophone and the tuned instrument. Um, the skin drum, which of course was the, the tool of shamans. shamans. Shamans would sew bird bones into the skin of a drum and tap it, and it would create that distinctive snare sound that, that all modern drummers use. Um, and that's a way of opening up a line of communication with the, with the spirit world. Um, so again, the, the idea of separating sport and music and, and religion and theatre and performance out from each other, I think would be alien to most c cultures in the past. Religion was a practical thing. Sport was a practical thing. It's a way of testing your mettle and, and, and competing and, and preparing for battle. Um, and, and music is a way of, of communicating that transcends verbal language. Um, there's a, there's a, a photograph in the book that was taken by a, a, a friend of mine who, who went behind the Iron Curtain. Um, both just before and just after the, the end of the, the Soviet Empire in the 80s and 90s. And she took a wonderful set of photographs of, of Romanian villagers, one of which I've, she's kindly allowed me to put in the book. Well, actually, a few of which uh, she's allowed me to put in the book. Well, there's a really beautiful one of a, of a really very old-fashioned traditional water wheel. Of course, you know, water wheel combines all those simple devices into a very complex device of gears and ratchets and linear drive and all sorts of clever things to, to mill grain, but producing mechanical advantage. It, it makes milling grain much quicker and easier. And on the front of this water mill, the miller is sitting playing a fiddle. It's just the <laughs> most beautiful image because it says so much, you know, the windmill, the water mill is doing the work and he has time to play the fiddle. And, you know, I've asked myself the question, of all the technological inventions that humans have come up with, in nuclear fission, um, space telescopes, uh, guns, weaponry, art, all those things, is there anything more sophisticated than the violin? I don't know. Is there anything more sophisticated than the violin? I can't think of anything that's cleverer. No, I, I, when I wrap my brains, you know, the, the amount of technology and thought you've had to put through into that would be incredible. Uh, yeah, the, the violin, the great violins, and, you know, there is, there is no greater violin than a violin that was made 300 years ago by one of the, one of the greats, you know, Stradivari or Guarneri or one of those, uh, one of those geniuses. And, you know, one of the, one of the interesting things about those great violins, I mean, the, the most valuable violin in the world sold for 13 million pounds. Um, and those violins are designed in such a way that they get better with age. They play differently in the hands of different musicians. Um, and isn't it fascinating that, you know, you can spend 20 million on a Van Gogh painting. It'll be hidden away in a vault. Nobody will ever see it. It's too precious. And yet the most expensive violin in the world has to be played. Otherwise it loses its tone. And that's a really beautiful thought to me that, you know, whoever owns these great violins and half the time you don't even know who owns them, they're loaned out to the best musicians in the world because they're worth nothing if they're not played. And they lose their sound. They have to be played. And yet the people who play them could never ever afford to buy one <laughs> themselves. So, and, and, you know, that, that's, that's just an extraordinary thought in a way that the, the ultimate peak of wooden technology can't be put in a museum because it won't work anymore. I mean, as, as you, as you will yeah. re realize from having read the opening chapter of the book, I'm not a big fan of, of things in glass cases in museums, which is why this, 
this conceit I've invented, this Museum of the Wood Age, which has a very, very comprehensive insurance policy. Visitors can come and imagine all these things and, and, uh, and take them out of their cases and use them and try them and break them and see what happens um, and, and explore that world virtually as a thought experiment, in a sense, the way that Shakespeare was doing it with his plays. Um, and, and of course, all the, all, the, all the tools that we've ever invented, all those metal tools with wooden handles, you know, the Museum of the Wood Age is absolutely full of these tools. Um, and every woodworker has a set of tools, sometimes handed down through the generations. Those tools have to be used. There's no point putting them behind a glass case just for people to gawp at. No, a chisel that your grandfather sharpened, last sharpened 50 years ago, has to be sharpened. And in strict museum terms, of course, that's anathema because you're, you're doing something to the artifact. Like a violin, a tool has to be used. Um, a building has to be lived in. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I go to all these museums where they reconstruct buildings. Or you go to a, you know, a ship museum where there's a ship, in, ship sort of, as it were, pickled in aspect. I mean, a ship has to be sailed. Um, and a building has to be used. Um, and all the buildings in my virtual imaginary museum of the Wood Age are used by visitors and the people who run the museum and the woodworkers across the ages. So, you know, one of, one of the things I've, I've done um, is to invite my favorite woodworkers. So <laughs> a master Japanese temple builder, King Alfred the Great, a man called George Sturt, who, was, who wrote about being a wheelwright, various other people throughout history, Archimedes, Euclid, stick them all in a room and let them have a conversation with each other and Shakespeare. Um, and, and, and pretty soon, if you do that, if you conduct that thought experiment in your head, what you realize, of course, is that although their verbal language may be incompatible, I don't know how your Anglo-Saxon is. Mine's weak. <laughs> my ancient Greek. But mine's non-existent. That's well, <laughs> my ancient Greek, very, very poor. My Japanese, non-existent. So, but you put these people in a room with their tools, they would instantly pick up each other's tools, feel the edge, perhaps bend it, perhaps give it a good shake, and then try it out. And the Western woodworkers would be amazed by this thing that the Japanese developed called a spear plane, because nothing like it exists in the West, with which they produce this immaculate finish to their wood without sandpaper or anything like that. Uh, and they'd be astonished at the complexity of Japanese joint work when it's to be hidden for all time. Only, only the master builder knows that that complex joint has been put into a building. And yet, on the other hand, you know, I, I think, w would there be anything that a, a Japanese temple builder would admire in Western woodwork? One of the things that came to my mind, apart from the spoked wheel, of course, which is a, a, a brilliant piece of engineering. But I, I did think that a, a Victorian carpenter who knew how to put together a sash window and all its components might impress a Japanese temple builder, just might. It's a pretty clever thing, the sash window. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't you know. Not many people can make them. Um, well, I, 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 I certainly wouldn't either, I must admit. <laughs> and yet, you know, if you go into an old building with a sash window and, you you know, with one finger it lifts up and with one finger it goes down, I mean, they're just perfect devices. Um, so I think, I think all woodworkers would understand each other's tools. They would understand each other's wood. They would... They would share the wonder of specific species of wood they would have an equivalent in their own culture of a, a soft easily carved wood or a, a wood that would always be used for tool handles or a wood that would be used for bearings in big machinery you know it might be oak it might be lignum vitae it might be ash it might be um, hinoki cypress or whatever all all woodworkers will have their own woods that they prefer you know in in england you would always use ash for the spokes of a wheel because it is high in compression and tension, very, very strong um, and light. In America, hickory is the equivalent. Um, uh, and some woods are so specialized um, that, I mean, I know this is one of the things you, 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 you've picked up in the book, that some woods are so specialized that when, when the, the colonial powers using the ship um, and the barrel one mustn't forget the barrel in the history of colonization because without the barrel you can't 
you can't survive long enough to to come back with uh with with the the things you're you're taking from other countries you know and and the the history of slavery is all built into that that one of the woods that was brought back from south america very very highly prized with this was this wood called lignum vitae which is so heavy that it sinks in water um very very dense wood um uh, termite resistant rock resistant because it's famously the wood that's used to make a set of heavy bales when it's windy in a cricket match because they won't blow off by accident but so remarkable is this wood so hard is it and so full of oil that it's still used to make the bearings for the propeller shafts in submarines okay so one of the most sophisticated modern technological devices still uses a wooden bearing because you can't get at these bearings once the ship's built once the once the submarine's built, you need something that will last for the whole lifetime of the submarine, and no metal component will, but lignum vitae will. And that's that's pretty cool. And 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 in, and and in some way, that really demonstrates that perhaps the wood age hasn't ended, and there is still some some usefulness in in wood. Well, let, let me ask you this: What simple wooden device transports most of the world's commercial goods around the planet? Oh, it's a cardboard box, isn't it? <laughs> it's a pallet. Oh, a pallet. Yeah, I've forgotten about that as well. Sorry. <laughs> Everything is moved around the world on pallets. Um, and even I could make a pallet. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's a really, really simple device. And yet, you know, we take it totally for granted. And you can make a plastic and you can... pallet, but they don't. Why? Because wooden pallets are better. And, and you can pick up Euro pallets anywhere else. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, and wood is sustainable and um, why waste another resource um, so you know wood still has utility uh, for sure I mean you know you, you you look around any new housing estate that's being built you know the wood is the, the, the roof is mainly wood the trusses are wood the floor joists are wood still nothing better than wood for, for putting a house up I mean okay they're clad in brick or breeze block or concrete or whatever and of course, now mass timber construction is making a huge comeback, particularly pioneered in the Scandinavian countries where they have vast quantities of trees. So, you know, the tallest wooden building currently, and that may, that may be out of date now we're talking, um, currently it's about 80 metres tall and, it, and it's in Norway. And they'll be building much bigger wooden buildings soon, much less waste than concrete, a lower footprint, less construction costs, less waste. Um, you can you can put a wooden wall up in a building and then decide where you want the door afterwards. You just you just cut the door out with a chainsaw, yeah. you know, whatever. Um, uh, and um, you know, you st we we stop putting buildings up in wood because wooden buildings catch fire. But really, big wooden buildings, it's it's the thatched roof that's the danger. That the wooden construction of timber it might scorch a bit and it might catch fire, but it's unlikely to fail before everybody gets out. And we used to think that was true of steel and concrete. We now know, of course, that steel and concrete buildings can and will fail, sometimes catastrophically, sometimes before people get out. Um, wooden buildings don't tend to fail before everybody's got out. And of course, they produce much less toxic nastiness. Um, so, you know, there, there is a new wood age. People are building bridges out of wood again, uh, I'm told that the Japanese space industry is about to put up a wooden satellite, <laughs> which <laughs> is a really cool idea. Destined yeah, and, to burn up in the atmosphere. Yeah. <laughs> and I've got one final, yeah, I've got, <laughs> I've got one final fun question for you, Max. Okay. Um, as we do for all, all of our guests here on, on history of Jackson, you are, you are a woodsman as well as a historian archeologist. I want to ask you, what are you, most proud of in your life as a woodsman? Um, planting trees, I think. Um, and I suppose, I mean, I don't, you know, planting trees is, is, is a thing you do for fun and in, in a way it's a sort of moral duty. But in terms of the sort of satisfaction, the gratification I get from using the wood from a tree I've planted, that's pretty special. But I think almost the most special thing that I find with, with growing trees 
I mean, all the all the things you can do with trees are incredibly, you know, gratifying, making charcoal, turning them on a pole over, whatever. But I think the thing I'm most pleased with seeing when it first happened was trees that I had planted produced seed and nuts that I could then propagate new trees from. And it still gives me an incredibly childish, simple sense of pleasure to see that cycle of, of life going on and to know that you've played a very small, almost in, in, uh, insignificant part in that. But to know that you are, you are able to see a new generation of trees going forward that you planted the parent, as it were, that, 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 I, that I get a kick out of. I, I don't know, I'm proud of it, but I certainly get a kick out of it. I, I, I can certainly see how, you know, but just being involved in that that cycle must be something that's really special. Um, yeah, I'm sure. So. I'm sure farmers get the same thrill from you know lambing season and whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I, I still get a, I, I do get a thrill out of that. Um, and I, I, I also enjoy cutting the trees down as well. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, they'll, they'll grow again. It's okay. I trust and... them to grow again. Yeah, well, hopefully they do. Yes. And if our uh, if our listeners want to learn more about the history of wood, where where can they where can they go? Well, they almost certainly have to buy my new book. Um, I mean, yeah. there, I mean, there are there are there are a few b- books that tell some of those stories. Um, uh, but I th- I think. I think the main lesson for people who are curious about the history of wood is is to reconnect with that material. I mean, I often do a an exercise with students and I ask them to sit down at breakfast one day and work out how much of their world is wooden. Well, probably a wooden table, possibly a wooden table, maybe wooden shelves, um, wooden chopping board, the coffee that they drink grows on trees. The orange juice comes from oranges that grows on trees. You know, actually, we still live in a, a world that is highly dependent on wood and trees. Um, the floor they're standing on, the creaky floorboard, well, that's wood. Try doing without it. It's, it's not easy. So, um, you know, I, th- I think, and, and do you know what really encourages me? You know, I love technology like lots of people do. I have a mobile phone. I have a computer. I like gadgets. I like gizmos. Um, You know, I I love what modern technology brings, the internet and all its wonders as well as its pitfalls. But I think what's really lovely is the fact that you can still go out and explore that history by picking up a stick and thinking of all the things you can do with a stick by pulling a young tree back and letting it go and seeing what a spring is like, winding a cord around a piece of wood and letting it free in your hands, um, inventing a knot, making a flotation device, getting in a boat. It's all, it's, it's the whole of human history experienced through that one material and, and the basic things that we can still experience. You know, it's quite difficult now to go and find one of the early computer chips but you can still go and experience the earliest human experience with wood because the trees are still there till we lose the last of them. Um, and that for me is reconnects us. Absolutely. You know, a child can still make a bow and arrow, you know, you can still light fire by rubbing sticks together. So we, we can re-explore the whole of that history. You know, every time you pick up a musical instrument, you're re-exploring that history. Every time you bang a drum, every time you, knock two sticks together, you're exploring that history again. So that, that for me is, is the classroom. Um, it, it's there, it's everywhere. So you can, you can relive it and re-explore it yourself. And then and the, and trying to figure out how you come up with the idea of a wheel, <laughs> <laughs> unless you know how to make one. And there's, and there's, and there's not very, very many areas of history where you can learn about it by getting involved and doing it, uh, which I think is, is really nice. Now, of course, Max, you've been an awesome historian. Uh, people are going to want to get hold of a copy of your book. Where can they grab the Museum of the Wood Age? Uh, well, I, I hope it's in, in uh, as they say, all good bookshops. Um, and, there, you know, there are lots of different um, online places, uh, which I won't mention, where you can get them. Um, 
Uh, and, you know, pe people often ask me slightly jokingly, aren't you ashamed of the fact that uh, printed books are made from paper, which cuts down trees? Slightly missing the point that the more paper we use, the more matches we use, the more wooden furniture we make, the more wooden buildings we use, the more we need wood. The more we need wood, the more we look after our forests. So go and buy a printed version of the book <laughs> made of wood pulp and enjoy the fact that it's, well, the very word book comes from the word, the, the Indo-European root for the beech tree, book and bok. It's the same book, bok, beech. It's the same word. So, you know, even our language is imbued with the history of the evolution and history of our relationship with tree. So there you go. Go and buy it. And go I'll make sure. It. Yeah. I'll make sure a, a copy, oh, not a copy, uh, a link to buy a copy of uh, Max's books in the description below, just to make it easier for everyone as well. And how can people connect with you online? Um, well, I, I have to say I'm not a great uh, member of the Twitter sphere, um, but I have a website, which is www.theambulist.co.uk, and, and people can, uh, um, can get in touch with me with me through that and periodically I write a newsletter when I can when I'm not busy cutting <laughs> trees down but I'll also you know I'm quite often out in the ground doing uh, the book festivals and things and um, so you know the, the chances are wherever you are I'll pop up at some time so come and come and see me and uh, I'll be happy to chat to anyone who'd uh, like to talk about wood Thank you. And I'll make sure a link to your website is in the description as well. So people can go and read some of your work, subscribe to your newsletter and learn all about the history that you're, you're teaching us all and making us all aware of. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming on, Max. I really appreciate your time and for you appearing on the podcast. So thank you. It's a pleasure. Nice to talk to you.